Imagine for a second that this orange is the Nintendo DS game Dragon Quest IX. Now imagine this banana is the popular video game franchise Pokemon. Now let's see what happens if we mix these two together. Oh, whoa. It seems we've discovered a new game called Nino Kuni. Let's see how it rates. Oh my god, it's the best game ever! Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch is a Japanese role-playing game developed and published by Level 5, who also developed Dragon Quest IX, and was released in 2011 for the PlayStation 3. The game is heavily inspired by the works of Studio Ghibli, who collaborated with Level 5 when writing the story. Ghibli also animated cutscene sequences throughout the game, and the music is by Joe Hisaishi, the man who famously scored most of Hayao Miyazaki's films. I've been wanting to play this game ever since it came out. I even watched Martin in the Littlewood play through the whole game, but it wasn't until a few months ago when I bought a Nintendo Switch that I realised I would finally be able to give it a go. That's about eight years of build-up, so did it live up to my expectations? <coughs> uh, yes? This may be the most immersive game I've ever played. I usually take a long time to finish games, but I was so absorbed in the world that I couldn't wait to get back into it as soon as I stopped playing. The story revolves around a small boy named Oliver, who lives in a quiet little town called Motorville. Oliver and his slightly weird friend Phil have been working on building a car. That's correct, two children who are probably about seven built an actual working car. Anyway, tonight's the night they're gonna test it. Phil decides Oliver can be the one to test drive the car, however, disaster strikes and he ends up in the river, nearly drowning before being saved by his mother, who then has a heart failure and dies. In the midst of Oliver's mourning, his stuffed toy comes to life, revealing himself to be Mr. Drippy, the Lord High Lord of the Fairies, and also the most Welsh man in the world. You just witnessed the rebirth of Drippy, Lord High, uh, Lord of the Fairies. He informs Oliver that he comes from a different world called Nazcar, which is in great danger because of an evil wizard named Shadar. Oliver also finds out that every person from his world has a soulmate in Drippy's world, and as Mr. Drippy puts it, hang on, your mum, <laughs> fuck me, your mum shared a soul with the great sage Alicia. A proper, proper talent, talent she was. I can't do the voice at all. What I was gonna say was, Oliver's mum is supposedly the soulmate of a great sage who attempted to take on the evil wizard Shadar, but failed and was trapped inside something called a soul snare. Hence why Oliver's mother has died in the real world. Because of this, there's a chance that Oliver, who's deemed the pure-hearted one, can save both his mother and Mr. Drippy's world. So they set out on an epic adventure together to find a stick to use as a wand, allowing Oliver to cast a gateway spell that takes them to the other world. When they arrive, they're immediately run over by a herd of mooses, and that's where the game ends, unfortunately, guys. Just kidding, they manage to escape the killer bison, and soon enough arrive in the kingdom of Ding Dong Dell, a city filled with cat people, but something seems to be a little off. It turns out that Shadar has been on a bit of a rampage and stolen pieces of many people's hearts. The only way to fix this is to find someone else with an abundance of the characteristic they're missing, and use part of that to heal whoever's lacking. According to this game, the heart is split into eight pieces, and I'm no surgeon, so I can't say for sure whether this is biologically factual, but that includes enthusiasm, kindness, courage, restraint, belief, confidence, love, ambition, and the pulmonary artery. I'm of course just joking about that last one, but the way you can tell who has an abundance of each piece of heart is by this glowing locket you're given. You can then engage the person in conversation, saying something along the lines of, excuse me sir, I see you have an abundance of pulmonary artery, may I have some? And then you take it before they can give consent and run away. Anyway, it becomes evident pretty quickly that the king of Ding Dong Dell, King Tom, is brokenhearted himself, so you have to set out to find some enthusiasm. First travelling to Deep Dark Wood to visit Mr. Drippy's friend, Old Father Oak, a giant humanoid tree who gives you some epic new spells like Fireball and Healing Touch, as well as teaching you about familiars. Familiars are small creatures that you can send out into battle like Pokemon. Unlike Pokemon though, these familiars share HP and MP with your main character, so when they die, you die. Familiars can be leveled up by gaining XP and eventually evolve. We'll go more into familiars later on, but for now all you need to know is this is the first familiar you're given, and I called mine Womp Man. Anyway, Treebeard informs you 
that something ooky spooky is going on in the forest, and after traveling through the dense undergrowth, you're faced up against a guardian of the woods, the first boss of the game. This presents a good opportunity to explain how fighting works. When you enter a battle, you can choose between your roster of familiars and characters to fight with. In this case, we only have Oliver and Womp Man. The battle then begins, and unlike many other JRPGs, this game isn't turn-based, so you can run around to your heart's content. As you battle more, your familiar and Oliver will learn more spells and abilities to use in combat, and apart from that, it's pretty simple. Attack when you can, dodge as much as possible, hit the target's weak spots, block when you see the opponent is charging up a special attack, and that's it. Going into the game, I was expecting to enjoy this style less than a turn-based system such as in Dragon Quest, but it's actually surprisingly enjoyable, especially once you've got other companions with you and you can just rev around while they do all the work. Another thing I forgot to mention is that as you're battling, small blue and green balls will fly out of your opponent, and if you run into these balls, they heal your health and MP a little bit. Also, sometimes a golden ball will appear, and this can charge up your special attack, which from experience seems to one-shot pretty much everything in the game. Anyway, after a walk in the woods, you return to Ding Dong Dell, get some enthusiasm, and go to the king. You can also now use the shops in town such as Core Masters, the weapon shop which sells gear to upgrade your stats. Terrible news though, King Tom has gone missing. Seeing as everyone from this world has a soulmate in our world, Mr. Drippy suggests going back to Motorville to find King Tom's soulmate, and when you arrive in Motorville, you find out the shopkeeper's cat has gone missing. A random girl with green hair leads you to where the cat is staying, and it turns out it was having a fight with a mouse. Therefore, Mr. Drippy deduces the disappearance of King Tom must also have something to do with mice, and upon exploration of Ding Dong Dell's sewers, King Tom is found to be fighting a giant one. This becomes a boss battle, and after beating up the mouse, the king gives you his wand, and you can now venture onward to the second major city, Al Mamoon, via a forest full of mushrooms. This forest soon turns into a large desert, and then, ah yes, I can see it. Al Mamoon. Jewel of the de- oh. Oh my god. What is that? Al Mamoon is home to one of the four great sages, Rashad. However, when you find him, he's given up magic and become a Babana salesman. Just to be clear, Babanas are supposed to be like the tastiest thing in the world, just based on how people talk about them. Tell you what, I'm starving! Fancy a Babana split? They look exactly like bananas though. It's at this point that you meet Esther, his daughter, who's heartbroken and lacking kindness. To cure her, you again have to visit the real world and find her soulmate, nicknamed Starry Mary. It turns out her father the one who's heartbroken, and he won't let her out the house because he thinks she's sick. Upon confronting the dad, attempting to mend his heart, you end up battling something known as a Nightmare, which is basically just another boss battle. After defeating the Nightmare, Starry Mary can now go outside, and you can go back to the other world and cure Esther, who then becomes your companion. Esther can also use familiars, and comes along with Gogo, who no joke, is amazing. Seeing as you can now choose between controlling Esther and Oliver in battle, if you choose Oliver, then Esther is controlled by a computer, and you you can command the computer as to what to do. There have been so many times where I've been just struggling against some bananas or something and Gogo -Go just comes in and ele electrocutes everyone. Richard tells Oliver of the other great sages and suggests he completes the Trial of the Sages, which involves travelling to the Temple of Doom from Indiana Jones and then talking to this really obnoxious guy called Solomon and his servant Mbopo, who just doesn't get enough credit in my opinion. The guy's a living legend, just look at him. The trials involve doing some weird puzzles and then you have to fight what appears to be the God of the Sun. After completing these challenges, Solomon offers you the choice between three different familiars, and of course I chose this trumpet looking ass, not realising he was absolutely awful. Solomon also teaches you about one of my favourite parts of the game, familiar taming. When you're fighting enemies in battle, there's a chance that once defeated, a love heart will appear above their head. If you switch to Esther quickly enough, you can tame them and use them to fight for yourself. The variation in different creatures you can tame makes it really fun to explore and build your team as you go through the game, and that isn't even taking into account the different evolutions they can turn into. I'm quite quite jealous of the person whose job it is to invent these creatures because I remember sitting for hours inventing terrible new Pokemon as a kid. I also like the fact they've included features that make your familiars a little bit more unique such as branched evolutions for the final stage, and stuff like naming just helps you feel more attached to each member of your party. I suppose my party at the time would have looked something a little bit like this. Wantman would have evolved by now as well as Gogo -Go becoming even more OP. I had Newt Newt, my weird duck thing, and this guy who carries two massive canoes around around with him called Timmy Tuba. Then Esther's team would have later expanded to include this owl named Bodge, and then interchanging between a goose called Dr. Osmond and a bat that eventually evolves into a superhero. <laughs> the creatures you face up against vary depending on the habitat
that you find yourself in. For example, Timmy Tuba was found when travelling up a nearby volcano called Old Smoky that was threatening to explode thanks to Shadar, and Bodge was acquired on the way to the next town, Castaway Cove, where the party see if they can find a boat to take them to the next great sage. Unfortunately, to be able to sail, you need a letter of permission from the Queen of Alma Moon, named Khalifa. This is bad news because the Khalifa has become broken-hearted, lacking restraint, and as a result, she's absolutely huge. So after finding her soulmate, going on a side quest to make cheese, and then feeding her the cheese, you can heal her heart, get the letter along with a picture of the great sage you're searching for, and can return to Castaway Cove to set sail. But oh crumbs, a thief! And oh crumbs, a nightmare too! This thief is a man named Swain, and after healing his broken heart, he tells you that he knows how to find the great sage in the picture he stole. Therefore, Swain joins the party, and can also take command of three familiars. For me, this involves a skeleton called Bag of Bones, a yeti called Big Ans, and the most OP familiar in the entire game. This guy is a large iron robot named Tin Whistle, and once evolved, he's the biggest tank ever. I didn't realise this until researching for this video, but Tin Whistle is actually kind of rare due to something called his star sign. Each familiar has a star sign of either sun, moon, star, or planet, and like the typings in Pokemon, these are effective and not very effective against each other, and are resistant to certain types of attacks like fire or storm or something. Tin Whistle here is what is known as a double star typing, where his stats are much better than they would be normally, and he's doubly resistant against storm and poison damage. He's just an absolute beast, trust me. Nonetheless, it's time to set sail for the continent of Autumnia and find the other great sage everyone's been talking about. Ah, the open ocean. Nothing like it, eh? Oh, but- Whoa! Whoa, a storm! No! No! Whoa! No! No! Whoa! 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 Where are we? Where could we possibly- What is that? The crew are blown off course by Shadar and end up on Tihiti Island, which is home to the fairies and Mr. Drippy's friends. This place, or the fairy ground as it seems to be known, is a bit strange to be honest. There's this large marshmallow thing which you find out is actually the mother to all fairies, aka she gives birth pretty much constantly, but every now and then, the babies inside of her get trapped and someone has to go in and help them be born? The only way to get inside her is through her mouth, and as a result, the entire economy of this fairy town revolves around stand-up comedy. What? You have to help the fairy ground's biggest comedy double act to perform a show good enough to make Drippy's mother laugh, and while her mouth is open from laughing, you could venture inside of her. You might be wondering at this point, what could possibly be inside of her that could be causing this sort of problem? And the answer of course is a giant jellyfish. Once the jellyfish is defeated, you can exit via Drippy's mum's blowhole, which is a sentence I never want to repeat, and it's now okay to travel to Autumnia, specifically the city of Hamlin. Hamlin is the third major city in the world of NASCAR, and looks like some sort of industrial steampunk version of London, but inhabited by people dressed as pigs. Here you meet the great sage you've been looking for, and not only is he the king of Hamelin, but surprise surprise, he's also heartbroken. But what can you do, guys? I guess there's just no hope. What oh We've gone back in time, and there seems to be rumour of a legendary wand. Let's go and get it, shall we? Move aside, Candleman. Now you have a legendary wand, it turns out the reason you were brought back in time is because this large man in a bird suit decided we needed this wand to defeat Shadar. Thanks, Birdman. After returning to the future, you can cure the king of Hamelin, Marcusan, and after thanking you, he says, Nice wand, man. You could make it even nicer if you had some gems on it. Here, I'll give you the map to find them. Oh no, wait, it's been stolen by the Sky Pirates. You should then travel to the Sky Pirates base to meet Captain Kablai and his dragon Tengri, who seems to be acting a little strange. Oh, for God's sake, the dragon's broken hearted as well. It turns out the dragon isn't soulmates with another dragon, but a human man instead. And once you fix things up in the real world, it unlocks one of my favourite things in the game. You can now fly around on this dragon wherever and whenever you want. Honestly, you thought this game looked pretty as it was until you're swooping over the ocean and suddenly the sky goes into sunset mode and mwah. Anyway, I'm not sure how much more of the story I should really go through, just because I still really want people to feel an incentive to play this for themselves. There are a couple more things worth mentioning though. For example, while hunting for the magical stones to put in your wand, you have to battle three different guardians, which involves you travelling to this snowy village called Yule that I really like. There are these large hairy people called Tom Tees, and I really enjoyed the dungeon and final boss involved in retrieving the stone you obtained from this island. I think it's mostly just because I played this part very late in the run-up to Christmas, so I was in a wintry kind of mood, you know what I mean. Also worth noting is the abundance of side quests available that gives the world a little bit more depth. Plus, there are these things called bounty hunts that often involve you travelling to small corners of the world, such as tiny islands, to take down mini-boss type enemies for loot. 
I think it's good they chose to show actual enemies rather than just relying on random encounters for battling, because again it just makes running around and exploring that little bit more interesting. By completing quests and bounty hunts you can earn stamps, and if you get enough stamps you can spend full stamp cards on minor upgrades to your character, such as slightly faster running speed, being able to jump just for the sake of it, not for any benefit, and giving Tengri this burst ability. I think the main reason I enjoyed this game so much is because the world is so rich and there's so much to explore, but at the same time they've managed to capture the sense of cartoon magic and wonder they have in Studio Ghibli films. It's like taking the open world aspects of Skyrim, the story of Dragon Quest, the creatures from Pokemon and the style from Studio Ghibli and then mashing them up into one amazing game. And sure there are some flaws to it, the story is kind of split into two halves with the first half in my opinion much more well done than the second. The creative freedom with familiars you can catch has led to a couple problems like the fact Tin Whistle is so big that sometimes he completely blocks you off from attacking the enemy. A lot of the dialogue is a bit cringe in places and my game actually crashed a few times in some of the cutscenes, but none of that stuff really matters or affected just how much I enjoyed the game to be honest. And if we're going to talk about cutscenes then it's hard not to mention just how good the animated parts of the game are. Each of these cutscenes looks incredible and really reinforces the immersion in the game because it feels like you're in control of an actual film. I was particularly impressed by the vibrancy of the colours they decided to use and they also managed to create close-up shots in a way I haven't really seen before in 2D animation. If anything, I kind of wish they animated more of the cutscenes, although obviously I understand how time consuming traditional animation is, so it probably took long enough to do the parts they did. And because Nino Kuni is so cinematic, I do think it has a lot of replayability. In the same way you might rewatch one of your favourite TV series, only this has the added bonus of customizability because you can use different familiars or focus on different game elements the second time through. Like, I haven't even bothered with the alchemy part of the game because it just doesn't really interest me, but when I replay the game, I might have a go at it because I'm sure the equipment I was using was far from the best I could get. Lastly, I should talk about the music. Joe Hisaishi does another amazing job at adding so much magic to the game's storytelling through his pieces that just seem to encapsulate a sense of adventure. You could be sitting down in an old people's home listening to the main theme and you would still feel like you're about to fight a dragon. On top of this, each character is given their own motif that adds to their personality and every town is accented with a regionalised theme that perfectly complements the location. And there's a wide variety of locations as well. We're given grassland, desert, swamp, tropical islands, industrial zone, winter wonderland, volcano, Aztec temple, and so on and so on. The amount of creativity behind the world they've created turns the plot from a simple tale of good versus evil to an exploration into a realm full of magic things, beautiful things, weird things, scary things, and every other thing you could imagine. You can just tell so much imagination and passion has gone into every aspect of the game, and that's why Ni no Kuni Wrath of the White Witch is definitely one of the best games I've ever played. So there you have it. If you're thinking of playing this game even in the slightest, please do, you won't regret it. For now though, I'm just gonna go slay some familiars. Please subscribe or Mr. Drippy will bash you with his lantern. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Bye.